Welcome to Kiss the Reviews. I'm Armando, that's Corey, and today we're doing 1988's Coming to America. Before we get started, if you want to follow me or Corey on Twitter, you can follow me at Junior D's. You can follow Corey at Corey underscore Idol. As always, if you want to follow the show, you can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Kiss the Reviews. Yay. So <laughs> let's let's get into this movie. We'll start with the cast because. This is a long cast, and mm -hmm. I know I'll probably mm -hmm. leave some people out, and if I do, I'm so sorry. But yeah, did you see the guy? The guy from our Toy Soldiers review actually commented and said, "I was in the movie, and you never mentioned me." <laughs> <laughs> he did. I did see that. It was actually a very cool comment, and he didn't say that. So it, it was nobody very, try and kill him. It was a very cool comment. Uh, so this film, Coming to America, stars Eddie Murphy as Prince Akeem Jaffer, Clarence, Saul, and Randy Watson, Arsenio Hall as Semi, Morris, Extremely Ugly Girl, and Reverend Brown, James Earl Jones as King Jaffe Jaffer, Madge Sinclair as Queen Aeolian, 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 John Amos as Cleo McDowell, Allison Dean as Patrice McDowell, Sherry Headley as Lisa McDowell, Eric LaSalle as Daryl, and Paul Bates as Oha. I'll be honest, I had Paul Bates as my ringtone on my phone singing Queen to Be for probably a good 10 years. She's your queen to be. And this... I know there's a lot of these movies that we do where I'm like, oh, I haven't seen this in forever. This is literally in constant rotation for me. Yeah. If if it's and it's on HBO Max. So if you haven't seen it, it's on HBO Max. But I have it on DVD. If it's on streaming, if I get, you know, you scroll through 50 movies before you're like, I, I don't know what to watch. Coming to America is always an option for me. Yes. It's always like that go to, and I find it funny every single time I watch it. Oh yeah, this is this is Eddie's magnum opus. This is his yeah masterpiece of a movie because yeah. it in, it encapsulates everything Eddie is. There's yes. comedy, there's sketch comedy with his character work, there's action. When he's fucking up Sam Jackson, there is just a slew of Eddie Murphy things all thrown into one. Yes. And it's so good. Now, so between good. between this one and I know we, we we've tongue kissed Beverly Hills Cop one and two. Um, but between this and Harlem Nights. Like these yes. are this one coming to America and Harlem Nights are my two favorite Eddie Murphy films. They're like one A and one B. Hell yes. But let's just jump into this. Um, so be prepared for another tongue kissing of Eddie Murphy's talent and how in awe we are of him. So yes. this film opens with Prince Akeem waking up on his birthday to a symphony. His servants are getting him ready for the day. And he has breakfast with his parents, the king and queen. And he expresses his concern about his upcoming arranged marriage. I love the absurdity too, just from the start, uh, like the unbelievable opulence on display here <laughs> yes. is just fantastic. Like he, he doesn't bathe himself, which is awesome, by the way. Um, <clears throat> he doesn't wipe himself, which is very weird. I would put my foot down on, like you can throw rose petals. He was like, he complains, like, I don't like having rose petals at my feet. And they're like, all right. No more rose petals. And it would be like, wait a second. No, no, no. My one is the wiping part. Yes, that's my... I would like my... to handle my own asshole, if that's, that's okay, Father. Do you think perhaps just once I might use the bathroom by myself? Most amusing, sir. The only person's fingers who should be near my butthole are mine. Yes. Like, I, I don't need, you know, somebody else doing that. That's that's. Or gross. my partner's on the, the right night. You just, you know, little... Yeah, I, after you sit on a like a fire hydrant for like a half hour. Corey's life lessons. Hi kids, Uncle Corey here. 
<laughs> if there is even a remote possibility that someone is going to be playing with your asshole, be clean. Period. Absolutely, absolutely. Nothing else needs to be said. Make sure your no. asshole's clean when you're doing butthole play. <laughs> any any butt stuff, your your butthole needs to be clean. Yes. We cut to his like engagement slash wedding party. He uh -huh. meets his bride to be, played by Vanessa Bell, and he has never met her before. And she's been trained since birth to obey his every command. These yes. scenes here with uh, with Paul Bates, the queen to be. Mm -hmm. song that he sings as she's walking in the choreography which i believe was paula abdul who did the choreography for the that dance sequence oh no shit leading up to i believe so that was could, really really good yeah i could be wrong but i believe she was the she was the choreographer for that and all of these scenes the and eddie murphy in this making just his like are you fucking kidding me face that he makes his he, his one fourth wall break here. Yes. There's two in the movie. Uh, yeah. And the the one he does here where bark like a dog and then he just cuts to the camera and stares like, what the fuck? Yes. That Brilliant. is I can't even describe how fucking it, it seems so small and stupid, and you're like, oh, he broke the fourth wall, and you know, da 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 da. That is such an Eddie Murphy brilliant move without yes. saying a word yes the and way I, he's able to make that face is just fantastic i don't know who invented the fourth wall break during a a, a movie during mm -hmm. a, a feature film but if it wasn't him he fucking perfected it period you were right i have a question though <laughs> okay the scene i i've always wondered this it happened again I know I can't be the only one. That bitch is hopping on one foot and barking like a baboon. Literally the entire time they're in Queens, right? <laughs> I never thought about it. Uh, unless he said to stop. Which he never did. She leaves um, the room hopping and still doing the baboon calls. Yeah. And you hear her while they're talking still down the hall doing the baboon calls. <laughs> So it leads me to, and then like they immediately prepare the royal baggage, everybody's sent home. That leads me to believe his bride died like two days later. She didn't eat, she didn't drink, she was just hopping on one, and, and by the way, hopping on one foot in heels, fucking props to Vanessa Bell. <laughs> yeah, she should have got, she shouldn't have got, she should have gotten the prince just based on that kind of athleticism alone. Absolutely. So Akeem here then gets a plan together to travel to America to find a wife that can stimulate his mind as well as his loins. And he and his servant, Semi, choose to go to Queens to find said woman. They rent an apartment in the slum neighborhood of Jamaica, Queens. And everything leading up to and including the them getting and renting the apartment is, again, brilliant here. And my favorite part, and I still quote this to this day. Hey, Stu, your rent's due, motherfucker. I still quote that yep. to this day. Was literally I don't care. going to say the scene that steals it right here is dude falling down the stairs. And yes. hey, Stu, your rent's due, motherfucker. Yep. And I won't even try and emulate what he did yeah. because he does it so It's well. perfect. It's perfect. It's and so good. It's <laughs> his character, and he only shows up a few times, the, the landlord, mm -hmm. but he is so good. And don't be pulling that falling down the stairs shit on me, you hear? Are you conscious? His character here mm -hmm. is comparable to Gil Hill and Inspector Todd in Beverly Hills Cop. Absolutely. Where he is just like that perfect character. He is that archetype. And everyone else since then in that kind of role is following in their footsteps. We then get the two going to get some New York style clothes. Then they go to the barber shop so Akeem can get his hair cut. And again, not to 
describe the scene and then tongue kiss it after every description. But all of these barbershop scenes are yeah. absolutely brilliant. Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall do such a good job with the barbershop characters. It's it, it it's perfect. The whole yeah. Ali, Joe Lewis, Rocky Marciano conversation. There they go. Every time I start talking about boxing, a white man got to pull Rocky Marciano out their ass. That's the one. The lines in here are so quotable. They're just, they're all fucking brilliant. And of course you get Cuba Gooding Jr. getting his hair cut yes. when they first walk in. It wasn't a cameo back then. It was just a part. I don't know if our viewers have had the occasion to frequent a black barbershop with an older gentleman who is cutting hair. Literally every single barbershop I have ever been in with an old man cutting hair is having a conversation about boxing. Yes, 100%. Nowadays, it's you, you young bloods don't know jack shit about, about real boxing. That's sweet yep. science. MMA is a bunch of idiots. Yeah. Sweet it's, science is boxing. Boxing. That's Neanderthals do MMA. The sweet science of boxing. That's right. That's such a great quote. I've heard that so many times. So Akeem and Semi then go to some bars. They run through a bunch of crazy and materialistic women. Another quote of a line that seems such just like a throwaway and almost forgettable is... When they sit down to the very first woman and she just goes, I have a secret. <laughs> I worship the devil. <laughs> I've got a secret. I, know I've got the I worship the devil. Yes. And then obviously you have Arsenio Hall as the one chick. And I want to tear you apart. And your friend too. That's just, he just, he, they both do such a good job throughout this. Oh um, yeah. And I'll, t I'll tell you this. All these women are, I celebrate all women and all of your wonderful personalities. However, Corey's life lessons. Hi, ladies. Uncle Corey here. If you are the woman in this movie who's, and then I want to produce my own songs and be in my own songs and have my own music video and then do music videos and direct music videos and then act in videos. You are literally the worst kind of person on the fucking face of the planet. Yes. For the love of God, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Please. So after going to these bars and striking out, not finding any women, they speak to Clarence outside of the barbershop. And they go to the Black Awareness Rally, and Akeem sees Lisa here, the daughter of local fast food restaurateur Cleo McDowell, who owns McDowell's. And it's such a great way that Eddie and John Landis and the whole team here layered in this exposition. You casually are introducing one of the main characters in John Amos. Yep. And the whole McDowell's franchise, which is like the cornerstone, the centerpiece for the rest of this movie. Yep. Just casually in the middle of Arsenio doing an iconic role with the preacher. <laughs> You're not going to hate me. Yes! <laughs> Arsenio doing that preacher actually made me think for the first time in a long time, there's a God somewhere. Because <laughs> he was fucking brilliant. And it's almost like every single person since this movie, since 1988, who did any sort of character as like their character was a, a preacher, mm -hmm. they just did an offshoot of what Arsenio did in this in these scenes. From this oh, movie. yeah. Much like Inspector Todd, much like, like yeah. the landlord here. Yeah, that's, that you are 100 percent correct. Shit. Even, uh, uh, what is it, Cedric the Entertainer is doing his own version of the guys from uh, Mighty Sharp Barbershop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all, all of these characters and all of these scenes have been mimicked and broadened out into full movies. Yeah. So many times. It's just, it's fantastic. I cannot say enough good things about this movie. I really can't. Yeah, and no. It's, and it's not just Eddie. like. So much of the other movies we've done with Eddie are all Eddie. 
You have yeah. bit characters coming in to do their part, and they have their moments, but for the most part, it's Eddie. This is not all Eddie. No. He's doing his it, thing, and he's having fun, and he's fantastic. But, dude, James Earl Jones, Mike, that dude just exudes royalty every time he is on the screen. Yeah. John Amos is a fucking monster and owns every scene he's in. Absolutely. And I, you, I mean, and I know he was from Good Times, but he was the straight man on Good Times. He wasn't the funny guy. Yeah. So him having this kind of goofy McDonald's, McDowell's kind of thing. That's that's Yo. such a great, um, mm. just a great storyline. They yeah. got the Big Mac. I got the Big Mick. Like, yeah. Because they go, they then go to and, and get jobs at McDowell's and Amos is walking them through the restaurant and, and giving more exposition behind the whole McDowell's McDonald's thing. But you get a lot of Amos here giving a lot of background to the whole thing, which makes everything moving forward even funnier. Yes. And he, and he what I really liked about his character here is if you have ever known an upper middle class guy who has owned his own business yeah. and really did come from nothing and has owned his own business. You know, they have this certain air of pretension to them, especially yeah. when they're around anyone they think is even remotely possibly lower than they are. Oh, absolutely. On the, on the social scene. Yeah, yeah. Dude, he plays it so well. You know, in 20 or 30 years with hard work, Maybe you could have a place like this for yourself. Unfortunately here, Lisa, who Eddie's going after, is dating Daryl. And this is where we meet Daryl, the heir to the soul glow fortune. Akeem tries to go the secret admirer route when he sends Lisa a pair of $500,000 earrings, but she obviously doesn't know who they're from. And then while in the restaurant, Lisa invites Akeem to go on a double date with her and Daryl. And Akeem taking her sister Patrice... Uh, as his date to the St. John's basketball game. And again, going back to uh, Paul Bates' Queen to Be as a ringtone, the reason I stopped the Queen to Be ringtone is because the Soul Glow uh, jingle became my next ringtone that I used for the next like five to 10 years. Just let your soul glow. Just let it shine through. I don't know who wrote it, but it has lived on for what's it been 40 years yeah. since this movie? 30, I, 35 years. Like if you sing the soul glow jingle, people know exactly where it's from and they will sing along right with you. Oh, I was going to say, I challenge everyone watching this. The next time you have opportunity at a karaoke bar or something like that, just start singing Soul Glow. <laughs> you will have a sing-along in that bar. Is it possible this story is true? Yes, it is. So we then get the robbery scene here where Samuel L. Jackson tries to rob McDowell's and Akeem and Semi are forced to thrash Samuel as they save the day. And, and this is where Lisa's basement officially gets flooded. <laughs> Because you can I, literally see it on her face. My my notes say this is where Lisa starts to really see how different Hakeem is. But yes, her basement also does get flooded as well. Yeah. Your boyfriend's over there with his fucking jerry curl and his tail tucked between his fucking legs holding a cup of coffee while Hakeem is beating the shit out of a dude with a shotgun because he has a mop handle in his hands. Yes. There's not a, my basement would have gotten flooded. Are you shitting me? A hundred percent. Hell yes. I'm in total agreement there. Oh, I'm surfing out of McDowell. <laughs> <laughs> Here to thank Akeem and Semi for their bravery, Cleo then invites them to his house to be servers and to park cars for him <laughs> at this party that this, I, I guess it's a Christmas party that they're having. This is again, another example for all of you young writers out there where Eddie does such a good job in a comedy script where he goes from, see, it's working. He, we're being accepted as equals now. 
right? And then yeah. just immediately, no, you're just doing a different menial job. Yes. He just actually feels that he's being kind to you to give you the opportunity to see his house <laughs> and earn a little extra money. Like, that's literally what Amos is thinking during that whole conversation, that he's Absolutely. really hooking them up. And again, yep. that is that pretension of that upper middle class business owner. So while at this party, Daryl pulls the biggest trope of all time by announcing that he and Lisa are getting married, even though he never consulted with her about it. He makes the announcement to all the friends and the family and everybody's so excited, except for Lisa, who's obviously pissed. Corey's life lessons. Hi. <laughs> Boyfriends hoping to be fiancés and fathers of daughters. Don't do anything Daryl and Cleo do here because this is horrible 16th, 18th century fucking weird shit where you bequeath your daughter to this gentleman caller. That's not how we do things here. That's yes. a grown ass woman in fucking America. I don't even know what the fuck we're talking about here. <laughs> like this scene was just like, wait, what? Yeah. Like I understand him wanting, you know, like I want you to be protected and I'm worried about you. And you know, I don't want you to have to struggle like your mother and I did. That's fine. But you just promised her to the fucking heir apparent of soul glow. Well, because to him, they're rich, rich. Like, yes, that's true. But also, but I was going to say, but also not really like, no, he, they have fucking season tickets to the Jets. A rich <laughs> man that does not make you. This is where Lisa and Akeem start to get a little closer. They're out on the swing set. She confides in him while outside that she isn't really ready to get married and how Daryl and her father are planning out her whole life. And she resents all that. And, and then after talking again, Akeem asks Lisa if he can cook for her. And when they get to his apartment, he finds that Semi has used their money to upgrade everything in their apartment. And now it doesn't look like he's a poor. So instead, Akeem takes Lisa out to dinner where they talk. They dance, they make out, do the whole thing. And this and is my favorite scene in this entire movie. Where he takes Semi's money and says, you can't do any more damage. And he hands it to two bums on the street. Yep. And you just think, dude, like, okay, you're showing again. He's a good guy. Lisa sees that he's a good guy, charitable. Yep. That's nothing to him. He's trying to help somebody out. And lo and behold... Who is it? Who Randolph is it? and Mortimer. You get the Trading Places cameo, which is brilliant. And what I do like about it, too, because it doesn't just stop there. And they play the music from Trading uh -huh. Places. And then when Akeem and Lisa go to dinner, they come up to the window and they're like, hey, we'll do lunch. Just them two being in that scene, bringing it around. Like that's, again the brilliance of Eddie for the story and, you know, just bringing that and, and placing them in there was fucking brilliant. Yeah. It was, and if, it was if amazing. You look at, if you look at the timing of it too, where it is in the movie, a lot of the silliness had stopped. We're like full into a romance movie now yes, where yep. he is, he is versus Daryl trying to win Lisa's heart. Yeah. While maintaining his anonymity. Yeah. Cool. But Eddie, being the fucking comedian that he is, brings in another sil bit of silliness. Serves no, no purpose. There's no place yeah. for it. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. But there it is, and it is literally my favorite scene in the entire movie. That That is great. Not my favorite scene. Uh, another scene I do like here is when they're dancing, and he goes to kiss mm -hmm. her. And she says, well, what about Patrice? And he's like, I'm yes. not interested in Patrice. And she's like, well, what about Daryl? He's like, I'm not interested in Daryl either. Like the delivery of it is so smooth. And it's like, oh, yeah, like we do a lot of PSAs and don't do that. Uh, no music or anything. Here's a quick do that. Act like fucking Eddie does in that fucking part of this scene. Everything's just cool. And he's like, I'm laying it out. I don't want nothing to do with her. I don't want nothing to do with him. It's right here. 
it's so it's just a perfect line in that perfect moment. Yes, and, and the the sly double entendre there. Yeah. Of I'm not interested in Patrice. I'm not interested in Daryl. And it seems kind of funny, yeah. right? And it's kind of a haha joke, like, oh, I'm not interested in them like that. Yeah. But he also means it the other way too. Right now, I'm not interested in a motherfucking person on this planet but you. Yeah. And it is so fucking smooth. It if, is. If you are 50% as cool as Eddie is in this scene, you are slaying ass <laughs> nationwide. Because Akeem took all of Semi's money, Semi then goes to the Western Union, remember those, to send a telegram to request more money from the king. When Akeem gets back home, he finds Patrice and Semi together on the bed. Semi tells Patrice here that he's the prince, Akeem is the servant, and the the whole scene between them two, between mm-hmm. Arsenio and Eddie here, where he's like, well, if if I if you're the prince, then what does that make me? Like, again, real quick scene, but it's a real funny scene between those two. And the fact that Semi has just fucking snapped here. <laughs> like, he is just... It's not that he just fixed up the apartment yeah. and then went and wired the king behind the king's back and, you know, asking for ludicrous amounts of money. Should I make it 400000 But now he's actually making out with... Patrice, Lisa's sister. Yes. And telling her that he's a fucking prince of fucking Zamunda. And it's just like, dude, I would have you murdered in real life. You're lucky we're in a comedy. Yeah. You are blowing up my spot. Big time, yeah, don't, dude. Don't cock block like that. What, no, you, what the fuck are you no, doing? No, no. A few days later, Akeem takes Lisa, who has now broken up with Daryl, to the museum, and his parents show up. First at the barbershop, then their apartment, then McDowell's restaurant, and finally to the McDowell's house. And what I always found funny about this these scenes is when Akeem takes Lisa to, to the museum. Mm-hmm. It's okay, this this isn't, you know, Wakanda. There aren't like movies about it. This isn't like a big, I don't know, a province in, in Africa where like you would normally see. I don't know, a museum exhibit. It seems mm-hmm. like a very small area in Africa that they're from. And I'm like, they just randomly walk in on the museum exhibit for Zamunda <laughs> for no fucking reason. Yeah, they almost they make it seem almost like a Wakanda in the fact that it's very secluded. Like in the opening yeah. scene, you're going through the jungle and you're following yeah. the river along and then just kind of set back in the back is this huge fucking palace, but literally nothing else. It's like, okay, they're smaller. They have all their wealth just because they are them. That's all yeah. they have. But the respect that is command, like the king has like secret service guys watching him when they get in New York and he's got these escorts everywhere they go. They are a very wealthy and powerful country. Apparently. Apparently. So I don't get it. And, and for, for, if we're going that route and it's like, they're a very wealthy and, and powerful, you know, country or whatever. Can you get can you put the the picture of the the royal family of that area in a frame? It looks like they crudely just pasted their picture on the wall. Of the oh museum. yeah, they're wealthy and powerful, but they're still African. And you know ain't no fucking white museum in Manhattan gonna That's a fair point. Pay them the respect they That's deserve. They're like here's like, a fucking mask we stole when we fucking invaded Zamunda in 1902. And it looks like they just took a piece of gum, put it on the back of the picture, just <laughs> stuck it to the fucking wall. After some back and forth at the McDowell's house, along with King Jaffe upsetting Lisa about her relationship with Akeem, Akeem and Semi then show up at the McDowell house, and there's this confrontation between Akeem, King Jaffe, and Mr. McDowell. And Akeem goes to chase after Lisa, and he gets to her on the subway. And after professing his love and renouncing his throne, she says she can't marry him and walks away off the subway. This is what is very frustrating to me. His reasoning is totally sound. Yes. I want, I didn't want you to know I was a prince because of this. I'm sorry I lied to you. I fucking love you. 
I know you loved me when you thought I was a goat herder. So what is the difference now? Like, it can't be like anything like that. You can't be uh, anti-elitist, I guess. I, I don't want money. So, <clears throat> like, again, he wins the argument. And she's just like, it won't work and runs away. And I'm like, no, that's not how that works. Yes. Like, I know you need the ending and the surprise and it's, ah, it's her. John Amos coming in and standing by the throne, which is fucking hilarious. <laughs> so great. But at the same time, there's no reason for her to run away like that. Yeah. Because ever all of his, re- it's not like he cheated. He didn't get caught doing something nefarious. You know what I mean? Like all of yeah. his, all of the things he did is actually justified for his purpose. The only thing going against him at this point is his dad's a really big dick. <laughs> yes. And from the sounds of it, John Amos is going to take care of that problem real fast. We then cut to the final set of scenes here during Akeem's wedding day. Akeem waits for his bride to be to walk down the aisle. When she finally arrives, he pulls up her veil and reveals that it's Lisa. Da, da, da. And he is excited and happy as his parents smile at them. And Cleo joins the parents up on the throne, which is just fucking amazing and then after the wedding akeem and lisa ride away in a horse-drawn carriage as lisa asks akeem if he would have really given up all that to be with her i have one issue because we get to credits here but i have one issue it's irked me since the day i saw this for the first time and it's irked me you know however many viewings later Mm -hmm. and i was told i was crazy and stupid for not liking this part of the this whole thing between Lisa and Akeem and she's like, you know, would you have given this all? And he's like, yeah, and I would right now. Would you like me to do that? And her response is, nah. Nah. And I don't know if that's just me being persnickety about just how people deliver a line. I just didn't like it. It's bothered me from the first time I saw it. and It still bothers me to this day. If there's well, one thing that I don't like, it's that. But everything else is fucking amazing. I actually did like that line, so I'm going to say you're being persnickety because we have a difference okay. of opinion and I can't be wrong, ever. That's fair. That's fair. Um, so, uh, yeah, since we're actually divided on this, tell us in the comments what you think. I want to yeah. know. I was just that annoying she's... or was it funny? Was it good? It's, a, it's annoying to me because I feel like she was... It's like it's a childish response. Like, if she just went, nah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, just it it just seemed like too much. You're like, basically what you're saying is, bitch, you're a princess now. Grow the fuck up. <laughs> we say no or no thank you. You were right. Again, I know I'm being a little persnickety about that final scene. This movie, again, we tongue-kissed the hell out of it. It's brilliant from front to back. It's funny yep. when it needs to be. It's serious when it needs to be. And I know a lot of comedians talk about like rom-coms and how just dumb and, and blah and cliched everything is. Mm -hmm. If rom-coms were written and filmed like this, all rom-coms would be fucking fantastic. Like this, it had the right amount of everything in it. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, there wasn't like this, Hey, here's this lesson. I'm going to hit you over the head with a hammer. You know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, I think, I think my mate, I, this movie treated us like adults. Yes. There was adult situations. Sex was on the table. It was talked about. There was adult language in use. Every now and again, there was a gratuitous titty shot or a butt shot or something. They treated us like adults. Yeah. So we were following two adults trying to fall in love. Whereas most rom-coms are like, look at us, we're adults, but we're acting like we're in a fucking Pixar movie. And that's not the f- that's not how real people act. Yes. There exactly. is no fucking fairy tale happening in romance today. Yeah. It's not a thing. This is more of what it's like, where you know, you're actually possibly meeting at work and getting to know each other and taking it slow, and they have other people that they're with, and other situations that are going to come up that divide you guys. 
that's real life. That's yeah. why this movie hits and why the comedy is so refreshing in it. Yes. Whereas instead it's like, oh, I'm Ella Enchanted. Who, which one of you guys want to fight over me now? Because I'm a princess. Like, get the fuck out of here. No, I mean, other than that, dude, obviously it's Eddie. We love Eddie. And I, I can't say really any bad things about this fucking movie. No, not yeah. a one. That's all I got. You got anything else? Nothing. All right. Well, for Corey, I'm Armando. This is Kiss the Reviews. And this was 1988's. Coming to America.